ladies and gentlemen. This is our final session for 2022. So as you see, we're going to be discussing with you again septal defects. By now, you're all well aware that the normal heart has atrial, atrioventricular, and ventricular septal components. And you are more aware than I that each of these components can be deficient when the heart is congenitally malformed. Over the course of this year, we've discussed with you the morphology of atrial septal defects. Over recent weeks, we've been going into quite some detail regarding ventricular septal defects. So to complete our sessions for this year, we're going to introduce you to atrioventricular septal defects. And what we're going to concentrate on in this introductory session is the phenotypic features of the lesion. And I hope you're all aware that now, in the situation where most commonly you find atrioventricular septal defects, there is a common atrioventricular junction. And it is that feature that we're going to be concentrating upon today. I'm sure that many of you still call this lesion an atrioventricular canal defect. And as we'll discuss, there's nothing wrong with that because it is, in essence, retention of the embryonic atrioventricular canal. But what we must not do is think of this lesion in terms of a cleft mitral valve. And that is because when we have the common atrioventricular junction, as I'm going to show you, during development, the atrioventricular canal has never been separated into the discrete right and left atrioventricular junctions. So in this setting, there has never been a mitral valve to be cleft. But what we're going to look at is the building blocks of the mitral valve can be recognized. So what I'm going to try to do as I introduce this session is to answer the question that is on the screen at the moment. Does knowledge of normal development now provide you with insights into the lesions we're going to look at, in particular phenotypic variants? And I hope to be able to show you unequivocally that the answer to that question is yes. So let's look at the development of and the morphogenesis of these lesions. And we can start with a picture you've seen before. It's a cut through an episcopic data set prepared by my good friend and colleague, Tim Mohan, of the human embryo at Carnegie stage 14. This is about five weeks after conception. And you're looking at the atrial chambers, but there you can see the atrioventricular canal. And we know that at this stage, the atrioventricular canal is supported exclusively by the right ventricle. We can see the beginning of the outro tract, and the outro tract is supported exclusively by the right ventricle. So let me show you another data set, the same stage of development. You've seen this one before if you've been watching our sessions previously. What we've done here is we've cut away the apex of the ventricular mass so you can look at the base of the ventricles. And there now you see the underside of the atrioventricular canal. And now you see clearly that it is exclusively supported by the left ventricle. If we look a little more closely, we can see that within the atrioventricular canal, there are two cushions and they are positioned superiorly and they're positioned inferiorly. And these two cushions have a solitary zone of apposition between them. And it's zones of apposition I'm going to be concentrating on as I take you through the ongoing development of these cushions as they become the leaflets of the common atrioventricular valve. So this is the early stage, 
And at this early stage of development, in essence, there is double inlet, left ventricle, common atrioventricular junction, along with double outlet, right ventricle, with the outflow tract itself having a common lumen. So the next stage of development we need to look at is the change that gives the right ventricle its own inlet. And we now know that that is expansion of the atrioventricular canal. So here is a, an embryo also staged at Carnegie stage 14, but a little bit <laughs> later than the previous one I showed you, because now you can see that the atrioventricular canal has indeed expanded rightwards. And it is this rightward expansion of the atrioventricular canal that has given the right ventricle its own inlet. And that has brought these cushions astride the ventricular septum. So there now you see the inferior cushion, there is the superior cushion, but now something else has happened. Because from the roof of the atrium, we have formation of the primary atrial septum. And the space between the primary atrial septum and the cushions is the primary atrial Raymond. We can see that rather better if I take you to a somewhat later stage uh, from when the atrioventricular canal has expanded, and I'm showing you a reconstruction. And this is one of the reconstructions made by Wout Lamas and Jill Hexpoors from the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. And we've been using these reconstructions throughout our sessions over the last year. And what you see here in yellow is the reconstructed atrioventricular canal myocardium. And it's the stage I showed you just a moment in that episcopic data set. The atrioventricular canal has expanded so that the right ventricle has its own inlet. And we've positioned the reconstruction so that you can look into the developing atrioventricular canal. And so you can see the superior cushion, you can see the inferior cushion. And you can also nicely see in this reconstruction the primary atrial septum. And the primary atrial septum has been growing from the atrial roof towards the atrial surface of those cushions. And as it grows towards those cushions, so it reduces in size the primary atrial foramen. But Jill and Wout have reconstructed another key feature that lets us understand what is going on in the normal heart and what is different between the normal heart and hearts that have persistence of the atrioventricular canal. And this is the structure it's shown in pinky purple, and this is the vestibular spine. Now, the vestibular spine has been recognized for a very long time, although for quite some of that time it was forgotten. So here is a drawing of a very important picture made a long time ago. This comes from the writings of Wilhelm Hiss. This is not Hiss of the atrioventricular bundle. This is the father of Wilhelm Hiss, who described the atrioventricular bundle. And Wilhelm Hiss, the elder, was the most prominent anatomist and embryologist of the 19th century. He was born in Switzerland, but he worked a large part of his career in Leipzig, in Germany. And this is an amazing picture, as you see, that he published in 1885. And he called this structure the spina vestibuli. There it is, we've translated it as the vestibular spine. And it really is seen as a spine coming forwards towards the primary atrial foramen. And it does really exist. So here is a section of a human embryo, the same stage of development, Carnegie stage 16. It's the stage where the atrioventricular canals exist canal has expanded so the right atrium has its own inlet and there you can see the primary atrial septum and it has on its leading edge a mesenchymal cap 
and it is the mesenchymal cap that is growing towards the inferior atrioventricular cushion and in this section it has almost closed that primary foramen but this is one of a series of serial sections through this embryo so going a little more cordially towards the back of the heart i can show you the next section in this series again you see the inferior atrioventricular cushion but there is the vestibular spine and it contains mesenchymal tissue that is growing forward into the heart from the pharyngeal mesenchyme and i can show you the same thing the mouse heart this is an episcopic section from a mouse heart at more or less the same stage of development there again we've cut across the inferior atrioventricular cushion you can see the primary septum with its mesenchymal cap but now just as Wilhelm Hiss showed us in growing towards the primary foramen we have the vestibular spine and it is the vestibular spine that will reinforce the mesenchymal cap to close the primary foramen and to produce the situation where we can have separate atrioventricular junctions and so this is the situation two, two stages later against a human embryo carnegie stage 18. now you're looking down on the atrioventricular canal and you can see right atrioventricular orifice the atrioventricular cushions have now fused note the zone of apposition where they have come together is pointing towards the right side but reinforcing the zone of fusion between the cushions we have the vestibular spine and so it is the formation of the vestibular spine that is key to understand the lesions we're going to be talking about because it is growth of the spine that separates the orifices binds down the primary septum and with its mesenchymal cap fuses the primary atrial septum to the surface cushions it is that process that then permits the aortic root to be transferred to the developing left ventricle and eventually to be wedged between the fused cushions and the ventricular septum as development proceeds furthermore the mesenchymal cap and the vestibular spine muscularize and they form a structure which we can call the septum of the atrioventricular canal it's within the atrioventricular canal but on the atrial side of the atrioventricular canal and in fact this septum of the atrioventricular canal formed by muscularization the vestibular spine and the mesenchymal cap is the true second atrial septum and that sets the scene for normal separation of the atrioventricular junctions. So before we look at hearts that have atrioventricular septum defects, we're going to revise for you the anatomy of normal development, and we're going to look at the situation when we have separate atrioventricular junctions. And Diane now is going to show you that in gross specimens, and then Justin is going to reinforce that to show you what now can be achieved with virtual dissection of computed tomographic data sets. This is a short axis view from the base of a normal heart. So you can see the right-sided morphologically right atrial appendage and the left-sided morphologically left atrial appendage with the pulmonary trunk and aorta normally related and the aorta forming the centerpiece of the heart. The aorta is also deeply wedged between the right atrioventricular valve or the tricuspid valve and the left atrioventricular valve or the mitral valve. And you can easily appreciate that how a cut made through or along the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve would put you in direct communication with the aortic root. This is a remnant or a, a, a portion of the primary atrial septum at the floor of the oval fossa and if I tilt the specimen a bit you can see a portion again of the anterior inferior rim of the oval fossa with this 
muscular component, the true second component of the atrioseptum, or the anterior inferior muscular buttress. If we look at this on a four-chamber view, here we can see our morphologically right atrium, morphologically left atrium, and this is the superior cable vein with the right pulmonary vein entering the roof of the left atrium. So between those two venous structures, you can see the superior interatrial fold on which the primary atrial septum or the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa is overlapping and closing the oval foramen. This is the anterior inferior muscular buttress and you can see how it forms the septum of the atrioventricular canal and separates the left from the right atrial vestibule. This is the mitral valve and here you can see the tricuspid valve with the normal offset with a portion of the right atrial vestibule or that myocardium uh, overlying the crest of the muscular interventricular septum. This is also a component of the inferoseptal recess and you can begin to appreciate how the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve in this area have a small area of fibrous continuity. If I place the section back onto this heart that was immediately anterior to the previous section, you can now see a component of the aortic root, and this is the non-adjacent aortic valvar sinus and the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve. And again, as I mentioned in that short axis, if you make a cut through that aortic leaflet of the mitral valve, you'll see that we end up in the left ventricular outflow tract or within the aortic root. This section shows us that area of fibrous continuity between the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve, and this is just near where the uh, component of the membranous septum would be formed. Here it shows nicely the roof of the inferoseptal recess, and when we look back at that other four-chamber section, you can see how the muscular buttress forms the roof of that inferoseptal recess. This is a normal CT data set looking at the right side of the atrial septum and the interventricular septum. And we've removed the free wall of the right atrium and the right ventricle. And we see a portion of the superior cable vein coming down into the right atrium. This is the area of the, the oval fossa or primary atrial septum. We see a very prominent eustachian valve leading to a eustachian ridge overlying the tendon of Tadaro. Here's the ostium of the coronary sinus entering into the right atrium. This is the area of the triangle of cock, which is marked by the tendon of Tadaro. The septal leaflet hinge line of the tricuspid valve and then at its base, the ostium of the coronary sinus. And so this uh, floor of the oval fossa leading up to the AV valve is the area of the muscular buttress, which is positioned anterior and anterior inferiorly. And we can also appreciate the aortic root, which is wedged down in between the tricuspid valve that we see here on the right side and into the screen over on the left side, the mitral valve. So wedged down in between the atrioventricular valves. And if we make this translucent, then we also can highlight that structure we've talked about before, the inferior pyramidal space with its upward or superiorly directed apex. And so if we can imagine there the floor of the oval fossa, and then we see the, the apex of the inferior pyramidal space, then that anterior inferior muscular buttress will extend from the oval fossa leading up to the hinge line of the tricuspid valve and then down towards the, the ostium of the coronary sinus. And we can mark the coronary sinus in purple and the hinge line of the tricuspid valve in this pink color. And then here at the apex of the triangle of cock, which I've marked here, we see the membranous septum. And if we take this same data set and then we rotate it so we look from the ventricular aspect up at the tricuspid and the mitral valve and then we rotate to position over to the mitral valve and its aortic or anterior leaflet 
and, and here I've marked the roof of the infraceptal recess in orange. If we take the midline of the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve, you can see how it, it runs right in line up the left ventricular outflow tract along the aortic mitral fibrous curtain up to the aortic root. And then just pay attention here. We've discussed in the in the past the floor or the the uh, roof of the infraceptal recess and we'll look at another data set but we'll show how that the leading edge of that uh, anterior inferior muscular buttress will lead right up to the roof of the infraceptal recess and so this is a different data set this is actually a patient that has a large secundum atrial septal defect i've colored it in but you can get a sense here this is the entirety of the floor of the oval fossa and you can see where it's a little more translucent where the defect is at the superior aspect of the floor of the oval fossa. But if we just look in a normal heart, this would be the floor of the oval fossa. This is the superior cable vein coming down. And I've colored the anterior inferior muscular buttress this pink color. And if we, we remember the anatomy we just went over from the right side, you can see how that leads up to the area of the, the hinge line of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve above the entrance of the coronary sinus into the right atrium, but below the aortic mound, which is formed by the wedged aortic root with the aortic mound being formed specifically by the non-coronary sinus here. And then we can rotate just to better appreciate the extent of that anterior inferior muscular buttress, which is the true secondary septum. And then we'll cut into a four chamber view and you can appreciate in this patient that has a secundum atrial septal defect, how dilated the right atrium and the right ventricle in. But if we come up into a, a five chamber cut, which is including the left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve, this is the, the roof of the infraceptal recess here. And as we start to dissect inferiorly, and, and there is the primary atrial septum or floor of the oval fossa. And as we go in fear below this non-coronary sinus of the aortic root, you'll start to see that pink color of the anterior inferior muscular buttress, which is forming, it's undermining the roof of the infraceptal recess here. So here into this four chamber cut, you see that anterior inferior muscular buttress and how it, it it um, is positioned at the anterior aspect of the primary atrial septum or floor of the oval fossa, and it leads right up to the atrioventricular valves, the tricuspid and mitral valve. So you've seen what happens when things go properly. We have separate atrioventricular junctions, but what happens if there is failure? of growth of the vestibular spine. It is failure of the vestibular spine to grow properly that permits the persistence of a common rather than separate atrioventricular junctions. It's still possible for the aortic root to be transferred into the left ventricle, but because there's nothing to bind together the junctions, the aortic root can no longer be wedged between the left atrioventricular valve the septum. And here is the key. Because the aortic valve is unwedged and the aortic root is unwedged, then the left valve closes in trifoliate fashion rather than in the fashion of the normal mitral valve. And that is why we should not be thinking of cleft mitral valves anymore, but instead we should be thinking of atrioventricular septal defects with common atrioventricular junction. And we know that because of our experience with these episcopic data sets. So here is an episcopic data set from a mouse that is very close to being born. It's embryonic day 18.5. And we were surprised to find that in this mouse, there was a naturally occurring atrioventricular septal defect. So there you see there is a common atrioventric junction. It's a four chamber cut through the data set. So you see the primary septum, the mesenchymal cap has muscularized and forms the drumstick on its leading edge. 
there is a persisting primary atrial foramen. What you can also see very nicely is that the inferior atrioventricular cushion has fused itself to the crest of the muscular septum, the ventricular septum. But the thing that is missing is the vestibular spine. And it is failure of formation of the vestibular spine that results in the retention of the common atrioventricular junction. So we can tilt this data set towards us and then we can look at the arrangement of that atrioventricular junction. So this is the echocardiographic orientation. You're seeing the right side of the heart to your left hand, the left ventricle to your right hand. And that is the opening to the aortic root. It has been committed to the left ventricle, but it is not wedged between the left atrioventricular valve and the septum. There is the superior cushion, which is forming a superior bridging leaflet. And there is the remnant of the inferior cushion, which is forming an, the inferior bridging leaflet. That is a mistake. It should read inferior cushion. The key, the two cushions have fused together. So it's no longer justifiable to think of this as an endocardial cushion defect. The feature is not the problem with the endocardial cushions. It's the fact that the vestibular spine has not grown properly. And now very nicely, you can see the zone of apposition between the left ventricular component of the two bridging leaflets. And then when you look at it in the setting of the left atrioventricular valve, beautifully you see how this left atrioventricular valve will close in trifoliate fashion. And that is one of the features of the commonest form of atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction. So now let's look at the features of this common variant of atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction. Because the phenotypic features stem from the commonality of that junction, and to emphasize again, that reflects the failure of growth of the vestibular spine. So the features we're going to be looking for are unwedging of the aorta, trifoliate nature of that left atrioventricular valve, and then inlet, outlet, septal disproportion. So we're going to look at that now in the setting of a common valvar orifice. And again, you're going to see it first in a gross specimen shown by Diane. And then Justin will show you how in the clinical setting you can identify these phenotypic features. A heart with a common atrioventricular junction has had failure of that vestibular spine to muscularize so that we end up with a common atrioventricular junction. And incidentally, in this specimen, the patient had right atrial isomerism with pectinate muscles around both the right and left components of this common junction and extending to the crooks of the heart. The aorta is clearly unwedged as it was not allowed to be incorporated normally into the left ventricle secondary to the common atrioventricular junction. If we look at this common atrioventricular valve, it is quite dysplastic, but because of that it shows the valvar leaflets quite nicely. So there is the superior bridging leaflet, the inferior bridging leaflet, which are not adherent to one another across the crest of the septum. There is the anterior superior leaflet and the inferior or mural leaflet within the right ventricle or in the right component of the common AV valve. The left component is made up of the left half of the bridging leaflets along with this mural leaflet. And you can see how the left atrioventricular valve has a trifoliate zone of apposition. This is the right side of a heart that has a common atrioventricular junction of the so-called complete type. There are 
deficiencies or some fenestrations in the flat valve at the floor of the oval fossa. Here we see the leading edge of the atrial component of this atrioventricular septal defect and the scooped out component of the ventricular septum associated with the atrioventricular septal defect. The bridging leaflets are not adherent to one another across the crest of the septum with this being the inferior bridging leaflet and this leaflet the superior bridging leaflet. If we look at the left component of this common atrioventricular valve from the left, you can see how it closes in trifoliate fashion so that the bridging leaflets are opposing one another across the crest of the septum during the cardiac cycle and this is the area that most refer to as the cleft when in reality it is a zone of apposition between those two bridging leaflets. Whether we have the so-called complete type or the so-called primum type of a common atrioventricular junction, there will always be sep inlet outlet septal disproportion secondary to the scooped out nature of the interventricular septum so that the inlet from the atrioventricular junction to the apex will always be of a shorter dimension than is the apic apical measurement to the aortic root or the distal component of the left ventricular outflow tract. And you can easily appreciate how this inlet dimension is shorter than the outlet dimension. We'll briefly look at a patient with a atrioventricular septal defect with the so-called complete form or more appropriately described as an atrioventricular septal defect with common AV junction with, with large atrial and ventricular level shunting and common AV valve. And so here we see a still image, which is from our textbook chapter, showing a normal four chamber heart, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. However, very clearly there's this common atrioventricular junction with common AV valve with a, a moderate size atrial and, and larger size ventricular level shunting from this atrioventricular septal defect. And if we play the video, then you can appreciate in real time with the heart beating, both atrial and ventricular level shunting from this, this uh, so-called complete form of an atrioventricular septal defect. And also you can appreciate that the, the common AV valve is relatively balanced opening into both the left and the right ventricle. And when we look at the AV valve, the common AV valve on FOSS, as Professor Anderson has gone over, there's a superior and inferior bridging leaflet component along with a left mural bridging or a left mural leaflet, which spans between the, the superlateral and um, inframedial papillary muscles. And then on the right side, we have a anterosuperior and right mural leaflet, so five components. And important to the Rustelli classification is where does this superior bridging leaflet, does it have attachments to the crest of the septum in the Rustelli A, or is it a free-floating bridging le superior bridging leaflet like in Rustelli C, or rarely there can be attachments to that superior bridging leaflet over to the free wall of the right ventricle in Rustelli B. So this is an example of a Rustelli A, where if we slow down, you can see right in the center of this superior bridging leaflet is an attachment that goes to the crest of the ventricular septum. So this is the Rustelli A. But if we focus on the left side of the valve, when the surgeon divides and closes the, the atrial ventricular components of the AV septal defect and addresses the leftward components of this common AV valve, you can think of it as the left mural, which if we open up the valve, you can better appreciate. And then there's a leftward component of the superior and inferior bridging leaflet with its zone of apposition, which forms that so-called cleft, which is not really a cleft in the leaflet, but the zone of apposition between the leftward component of the superior and inferior bridging leaflets. And then this is an example of Rustelli C. So we have the same five components of the leaflet, left mural, the right anterior superior and right mural leaflets, the superior and the inferior bridging leaflet. Uh, 
However, now very clearly we see that there's no attachment of this superior bridging leaflet. So this would be the Rostelli C uh, form of a, a common AV valve. And then in the AV septal defect, one of its phenotypic features, which relates to the development is there's lack of, of wedging or so-called unwedging of the aortic root from between the AV valves. So this is somewhat of a sweep from the left side over getting going over to the right side here as we open up the valve. But you can you can see how that aortic root is unwedged from between the, the AV valve because of that, that common AV junction didn't divide into separate right and left AV junctions. The aortic root is unsprung or unwedged, the so-called gooseneck deformity or elongation of the left ventricular outflow tract. <clears throat> And if we if we compare that here then to this still image, you can and we look at the blue line, which is measuring from the apex to the aortic root versus the red line, which is measuring from the apex to the inlet of the left ventricle, you can see how it's, they're disproportionate. There's elongation of the left ventricle outflow tract, as opposed to the normal heart where you would have uh, relatively equal distances of these two measurements. So what Diane and Justin have now shown you is the typical example of atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction, but also with a common atrioventricular valvar orifice. And I'm sure many of you will call this a complete defect. However, the mouse I showed you also had a common atrioventricular junction, but with separate valvar orifices within the common junction. Many of you may consider this to be a partial defect, but is there really any real, any good reason for thinking that the so-called partial defect is any less than the so-called complete defect? Well, a long time ago, Anton Becker and I took this heart and we stripped away the valvar leaflets from the atrioventricular junction. And then we took this picture of the left ventricular aspect of the septum. And very beautifully, you can see the disproportion between the inlet and the outlet dimensions. <laughs> we did this initially in a solitary heart. But then when I was working in Pittsburgh during the early 1980s, we took the whole series of hearts in the Pittsburgh archive and we measured the extent of inlet outlet septal disproportion. So this is the graph showing you the proportion of the inlet compared to the proportion of the outlet. And as you see, it's a bell shaped curve. That's the situation with the so called complete defect. But we did the same thing when there was separate orifices within the common atrioventricular junction, the so-called partial defect. And as you see, the inlet-outlet disproportion does not distinguish between the two. So there's no justification for thinking of one or the other being partial or complete, depending on inlet-outlet septal disproportion. We also looked at the arrangement of the atrioventricular junction itself. And here now, one of the hearts from the Pittsburgh archive, I've dissected it, so you're looking down on the atrioventricular junction from above. Now the left side of your heart is to your left hand, the right side to your right hand. And beautifully, I hope you see the commonality of the atrioventricular junction. And you see that there is unwedging of the aortic root. Now, if you look carefully on the plane of the ventricular septum, you see in this heart, the superior, the inferior bridging leaflets are separate as they extend between the ventricles. And this, of course, is because the heart not only has a common junction, the common junction is guarded by a common valvar orifice. So this is the so-called complete defect. Well, I did a dissection just like this in the allegedly partial defect. And what I hope you can now see 
is that the atrioventricular junction is just as common. The aortic root is just as unwedged. But now when we look along the plane of the ventricular septum, we see the difference between the two. Because now there is a tongue of valvar tissue that joins together the superior and the inferior bridging leaflets. And that, in essence, has given us separate valvar orifices for the right and left ventricles. So the junction is just as common in both variants. I've shown you by the measurements we've did, there's no difference in terms of inlet, outlet, septal disproportion. You've seen for yourself, there's no difference in the extent of unwedging of the aorta. The variants have that same basic morphology. So the so-called partial defect is no more than dual orifice within that common atrioventricular valve. So now let's look at that anatomy again and let's see it first demonstrated to you by Diane. And then with Justin showing you the clinical manifestations when you have dual orifice common atrioventricular valve, the so-called ostium primum defect. Here we have a heart with a common atrioventricular junction. And this is the so-called primum ASD or atrial septal defect, when in reality it is not an atrial septal defect at all. It is the atrial component of a common atrioventricular valve or atrioventricular septal defect. The oval fossa is fairly well formed with a few fenestrations in the flap valve, so a very well formed primary portion of the atrial septum, and there is the coronary sinus. This area is where the vestibular spine failed to muscularize. And you can see in this particular heart nicely that if this area would have muscularized, there would have been two separate atrioventricular junctions and the aorta would have been able to normally wedge itself into the left ventricle. This portion is deficient in this specimen, so there is a common atrioventricular junction. And if I tilt this up, this common atrioventricular junction has two separate orifices, a right orifice and a left orifice, which we'll look at in a moment. The superior bridging leaflet and the inferior bridging leaflet are attached to one another across the crest of the septum, effectively separating this common atrioventricular junction into right and left components. Looking at the left component of this common atrioventricular valve, here we see the leading edge of the atrial septum and the flat valve that's fenestrated at the floor of the oval fossa. The bridging leaflets, again, you can see are adherent to one another across the crust of the septum with the zone of apposition, or what some people call the cleft, pointing directly at the interventricular septum. Even though there are separate orifices in this heart, there is still a degree of scooping out of the ventricular septum, and the inlet-outlet disproportion is still discrepant between the inlet and outlet components. So if we look at the hinge point of the atrioventricular valve to the apex on the inferior aspect or on the inlet, it is much shorter than that dimension on the outlet component. The aortic valve isn't opened here, but you can truly appreciate that this outlet dimension is much greater than the inlet dimension. So again, a common atrioventricular junction with separate right and left orifices that still exhibits the same features as does the so-called complete type of atrioventricular septal defect. As well, in this case, the aorta is unwedged and unable to join the left ventricle in usual fashion. Now we're going to look at a patient that has a so-called partial atrioventricular septal defect. 
or more appropriately termed an AV septal defect with exclusively atrial level shunting. And so a clue in general to an atrial ventricular septal defect is not only the elongation of the left ventricular outflow tract or gooseneck deformity, but it's also the papillary muscle configuration within the left ventricle. So normally the papillary muscles are positioned more or less here and here so that the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve is positioned towards the left ventricular outflow tract, which if we come superiorly into the left ventricular outflow tract would be positioned right here. In an AV septal defect, the papillary muscles are counterclockwise rotated from the imager's perspective. And so we see the papillary muscles position in more of a superior inferior position. And this is inferior because right here is the diaphragm. We can see the liver here. And this is the, the superior direction. So this is a clue here, that superior inferior orientation of the papillary muscles to an atrioventricular septal defect, in addition to what we had just looked at with the elongation of the left ventricular outflow tract or gooseneck deformity. And so this is the same parasternal short axis view. We've now come up to the base of the heart near the, the AV valves. And we can see that this in color comparison that this left AV valve is trifoliate. We see the left mural leaflet, which is spanning between the superior and inferior papillary muscles. And then we can see what looks like a break in the leaflets, which represents this so-called cleft. And looking on color comparison, we see significant regurgitation coming from this quote-unquote cleft, which as we mentioned, more appropriately represents or more accurately represents the leftward component, the zone of apposition of the leftward component between the superior and inferior bridging leaflets. So in this partial form, as mentioned, there's a tongue of tissue that is between the superior and inferior bridging leaflet. And since there's exclusively atrial level shunting, the valve is matted down against the crest of the ventricular septum with that tongue of tissue, not allowing any ventricular level shunting. Um, and this, this zone of apposition or so-called cleft is directed towards the, the, um, the, this portion of the interventricular septum, the, the, the middle portion, as opposed to a true isolated cleft in the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve where the papillary muscles are positioned uh, superlateral and inframedial, that aortic leaflet of the mitral valve is directed, as we said, towards the left ventricular outflow tract in this direction, and that true cleft is directed towards the left ventricular outflow tract. And so this is a, a four-chamber view, and we can see, even without color, that there's no suggestion of ventricular level shunting. We're, I'll have to pause the video, but we can, we can see we're a little off axis here, but we can see the primary atrial septum here, and there's, there's um, exclusively atrial level shunting of this AV septal defect with a, a common AV junction. We see how both the left and right sides of this AV valve are at the same, the same level. Um, we, we saw in the prior view how it's divided into a, a separate left and right AV valve orifice from that tongue of tissue. And, and they're matted down against the crest of the septum. So there's exclusively atrial level shunting. And then if we go to a subcostal long axis view and, and we, we um, sweep anteriorly away from the coronary sinus, then we see right here is the, the posterior interatrial infolding, the so-called secondary septum. There is the primary atrial septum, and we can see on color that there is a, a patent foramenal valley there, or, or patent oval frame, and, and we, we see the shunting there. But then the remainder of this primary atrial septum is intact, and then there's a relatively large uh, atrial component of the atrioventricular septal defect, so exclusively atrial level shunting, and we see no evidence here of ventricular level shunting. And these are the forms where three-dimensional echo become paramount. This is where we can really, if there's question on 2D echo, which is commonly 
the case, we can easily see if we look by three-dimensional echo here, looking from the atrial aspect at the left and right sides of this common AV valve, and then here the, the ventricular aspect. And we can, if we look at the atrial aspect, and we, we look at that left-sided AV valve, we are getting a little bit of the primary atrial septum, but you can see right there the tongue of tissue between the superior and inferior bridging leaflets. And you can see how it's dividing it into separate left and right uh, AV valve orifices. And if we, so we have the, the leftward component of the superior inferior bridging leaflet, and then here is the left mural leaflet. And then this is looking from the, um, looking from the, ventricular aspect so there's the leftward aspect of the superior inferior and then here's that left mural leaflet so this trifoliate nature of this left av valve also with the trifoliate nature of the the right av valve so the anatomy is basically the same in all types of atrioventricular septal defect with common atrioventricular junction. But you know as well as I do that there is variability within the basic phenotype. So what produces the variability? You've already seen one of the features is the arrangement of the bridging leaflets to each other. And it is that difference that determines whether there is a common valvar orifice or separate orifices for the right and left ventricles. Let's now concentrate on the second key feature, and that is the relationship of the bridging leaflets to septal structures. So let me show you a drawing of a four chamber cut of an atrioventricular septal defect. There is the atrioventricular septal defect, but at this stage, I've not put in bridging leaflets. So we started off by looking at the bridging leaflets in the setting of common valvar orifice. And in that setting, almost always, the leaflets are positioned in such a way that there is the potential for shunting at both atrial and ventricular levels. You've now seen the situation in which, in the so-called partial defect, the bridging leaflets are attached to the crest of the muscular ventricular septum. And it is that that confines shunting at atrial level. But many of you may call that an atrial septal defect. That, however, is incorrect because the shunting that we've just been looking at in diagrammatic form is shunting through the atrial component of an atrio ventricular septal defect. So to reinforce that, Diane now is going to show you the ostium primum defect again and is going to emphasize that it is an atrioventricular septal defect for which there is shunting at atrial level. And then again, Justin will give you the clinical manifestations of this feature. This is an unbalanced atrioventricular septal defect with right dominance and so-called primum type of atrioventricular septal defect. In the roof of the right atrium, we can see the superior cable vein and my fingers are holding the inferior cable vein. There is a well-formed atrial septum. You can see the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa here is well-formed and it is propatent. This is the leading edge of the atrial septum or the atrial component of the atrioventricular septal defect. Here are the bridging leaflets, the inferior bridging leaflet and the superior bridging leaflet, and they are adherent to one another across the crest of the ventricular septum, so that there is no possibility for shunting at the ventricular level. The only possibility for shunting is at the atrial level. The valvar leaflets block off any ventricular uh, communication secondary to them being adherent to one another and adherent to the crest of the septum. This gives us, in this case, a hypoplastic left orifice 
and a dominant right orifice to this common atrioventricular junction with shunting only possible at the atrial level. And so to end our review by echocardiography, we'll again look at a patient that has an atrioventricular septal defect with exclusively atrial level shunting or so-called partial defect or osteum primum. So this is looking at an apical view and we're tilting so we get a little better angle of incination across the atrial septum. And you can see at the end here, we're tipping inferiorly towards the coronary sinus opening into the right atrium. And if I scroll back, then we start to see the exclusively atrial level shunting. So we, we see a little aneurysmal tissue here below the AV valve, but we see no shunting, no ventricular level shunting, and just this atrial level shunting. Uh, the so-called partial defect. And if we look at the, the primary atrial septum, we don't see any secundum atrial septal defect. We see, we see some flow here, which is coming, coming down from the superior cable vein, but we see nothing coming across the primary atrial septum. So the, there's no secundum ASD. There, there's no uh, atrial septal defect. There's only there's a, a atrioventricular septal defect with exclusively atrial level shunting. So what you've now seen is that when the bridging leaflets are firmly attached to the crest of the muscular ventricular septum, shunting across that atrioventricular septal defect will be confined at atrial level. But we can also have the situation where those bridging leaflets are firmly attached or a butt on the underside of the atrial septum. And I hope you will now immediately appreciate that in this setting, all the shunting is going to be at ventricular level, but shunting through the ventricular component of an atrioventricular septal defect. I'm going to show you this in pictures of specimens. This is one of the beautiful pictures taken by Diane. It's a heart from the Idris Archive at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. And there you see the superior bridging leaflet. And what you can see is that it abuts firmly during ventricular systole with the leading edge of the atrial septum, as does the inferior bridging leaflet. So to all intents and purposes, during ventricular systole, the atrial septum can be considered to be intact. And then, because we have an atrioventricular septal defect, there will be exclusively ventricular shunting. So this is the situation in a heart from a child from the Idris Archive. This is another picture. This is one of Diane's fetal specimens, and it's showing you the same thing. You see the superior bridging leaflet, the inferior bridging leaf, this time they are firmly adherent to the leading edge of the atrial septum, again, essentially giving us an intact septum, but here we have a persistence of a defect at the oval fossa. But the shunting here is exclusively at ventricular level again through an atrioventricular septal defect. And we can see the same thing in one of my own specimens from a long time ago. We have a common atrioventricular junction. And this shows you very nicely how the inferior bridging leaflet is attached to the leading edge of the atrial septum. And that means that shunting across the atrioventricular septal defect is confined at ventricular level. So what I've shown you is when the bridging leaflets are attached to the leading edge of the atrial septum, the, the lesion remains an atrioventricular septal defect, but with exclusively ventricular shunting. And that also means the heart will have all the phenotypic features, including a trifoliate left valve. So now we note and we need to distinguish this from perimembranous inlet defects and from straddling tricuspid valve, both of which have separate atrioventricular junctions. It is the commonality, the atrioventricular junction that is the key, along with 
trifoliate nature of the left atriometric valve. And that is because the bridging leaflets are attached to the underside of the atrial septum. So now there is exclusively ventricular shunting through an atrioventricular septal defect. And then to conclude the consideration of shunting, we must remember that on occasion, there can be spontaneous closure of a pre-existing atrioventricular septal defect. And then we'll have the paradoxical situation where the heart will have all the phenotypic features, but with no shunting across the defect, which had initially been present during development. The heart itself, however, will show all the phenotypic features, including a trifoliate left atrioventricular valve. There are, of course, many other features that are of clinical significance. One of these is the extent of bridging of the superior leaflet. And that is what is known as the Rastelli classification. We don't have time to discuss that with you today. We don't have time to discuss the important feature of ventricular dominance, nor to go through the associated lesions that can accompany the lesion, nor to discuss the importance of the arrangement of the conduction axis. And perhaps next year, we will have time to delve into these details. But today, hopefully we've given you the basics to understand the anatomy of atrioventricular septal defect. What we've tried to emphasize, the phenotypic feature is the commonality of the atrioventricular junction. And what we've then emphasized is that the variation depends on the relationships of the bridging leaflets to each other, to the septal structures. Had we had time, we'd also have discussed the relationship between the common junction and the ventricular mass, because it is that which underscores ventricular dominance. But what I also hope we've managed to do today is to show you how, with our current knowledge, of development, we can provide a rational explanation for all these lesions. So that completes our presentations for 2022, and hopefully we'll be able to resume all our discussions as we enter the new year. And then again with Diane and Justin, we look forward to sharing with you much more knowledge regarding the anatomy of the congenitally malformed heart. So hopefully I'm now in charge and I have control of what's going on. I'm pleased to see that Adrian has joined us. Norman, do you want to start off with some comments on what you've seen, which to my mind put everything very nicely into context? I hadn't appreciated, in fact, that Justin would be showing us also the details of the Rastelli classification. So when I said in my summary that we had not seen the Rastelli classification. I think, in fact, Justin had shown us that rather nicely. But Norman, your thoughts, you've been looking at these for a long time and you're an expert in echocardiography. What thoughts do you have about what you've seen today? Well, I mean, I think Justin did a great job on uh, describing the details. There's only one issue on uh, that I think needs to be focused on that has not been described and that is that when the, the AV septal defect occurs, the papillary muscles do rotate in a counterclockwise direction, but the, uh, the inferior leaflet rotate, uh, uh, papillary muscle rotates more than the superior one so that the papillary muscles are closer together and may be so close together that they may form a single papillary muscle. And I think this is, needs to be emphasized for. Um, the viewers, that when we are looking at AV septal defects, the position of the papillary muscle is very important uh, to uh, define for the surgeon. So that's the one point I wanted to make about um, um, the papillary muscles. The second point that has interested me, Bob, and that we didn't articulate very well, 
is that this tongue of tissue that grows, grows exclusively from the inferior leaflet. Do you have a comment about that? Uh, it, is, it is certainly the case that uh, the zone of apposition is much more angled relative to the, uh, the common junction when you have separate valvar orifices than when you have a common orifice. And that would go along with what you say, that in fact, it's, it tends to be the inferior leaflet that has a beak that pushes forward, as it were. I think that's the point right. you're making, is it not? Correct. That's what I was, I was saying. And that is indeed the case. And uh, Chark Abels, a long time ago, pointed out that the zone of apposition has that acute angle. If, if we're looking at it from the atrial aspect relative to the septum when you have the osteum primum defect, whereas it, it's at a right angle relative to the septum when you have the common valvar orifice. So it's Great. an important point you make there. I mean, there are oh. many other things that we would have liked to have demonstrated, but we were introducing the situation as it were today, but we can do so much more. And the point you make about the papillary muscles, the point you make about the zone of apposition, these are all things that we can move on to and we can uh, exemplify if we move on and if we continue our sessions next year. Yes, and I, 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 one last point from my point of view is you show the atrial anatomy very beautifully. Diane's pictures are always special. Uh, I was just unfortunately uh, not a, um, aware that uh, where, where the AV node lies in when you looked at it in the atrial septum surface and I, I'm I'm sorry that we don't have that because I know that it's displaced superiorly and uh, it's it's important uh, for the students of anatomy that are going to be doing surgery to know where the AV node is is lying when they do a repair. In the and maybe Adrian can give us some information on that. Well, Adrian, we're pleased that Adrian is with us again today. Adrian, do you have any comments? Um, yes, a few ones. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't Perfect. see you anymore. I can see you in my little screen. Have you got your... Don't worry, I have to use two devices because the laptop is different. So, um, first of all, I, I really enjoyed the session. And Diane, really thank you for those specimens. They make um, our job so much easier. And uh, from a few points from the surgical point of view, um, the mural leaflet on the left side is very, very important. Um, the fact that the superior bridging leaflet can attach itself to the interventricular septum can pose problems for future left ventricular outflow, outflow obstruction. So the relationship between the scooping of the interventricular effect towards the aortic root and how the superior bridging leaflet comes on that area can pose a problem for left ventricular output tract obstruction and whether we use one patch repair or two patch repair. Uh, so that's something to, to remember. The other thing that I find fascinating is the discussion on junction. The more I think about this part, the more I want to understand this junction because Normally, we don't know whether the two AV valves come like this or come like this, like a double barrel gun or like a figure of eight. Because if we understand that, and I think next year we should discuss those things more, then we can understand what happens with that inferior pyramidal space, inferoceptal recess, because we need to, to, to go into the details of how much effort the heart does into separating the two uh, musculatures of the atriums and the ventricle. That's a key because if we understand that, we understand how distorted the ventricular musculature is when we have a common AV junction. And I hope we can use advanced imaging to use of what happens with the ventricular and atrial muscle in this common AV junction. In because fact, you make a very good point there, Adrian, because it it, what we can show, and the point you make is particularly pertinent to virtual dissection because it is the inferior pyramidal space. And one of Justin's images showed you beautifully the fat within the inferior pyramidal space. And of course, that is lacking 
when you have the common AV junction. And that is why, as Norman emphasized, the atrioventricular node is then found inferiorly because there is nothing that lifts the whole, it, it seems to be lifting up, but in reality, it's because the atrioventricular junctions themselves uh, expand inferiorly. And as you say, these are points that we can move into, we can exemplify when we continue our sessions next year. Absolutely. We, we need to discuss this because it's important. It is, I don't think Justin is with us, is he? Are you with us, Justin? I don't see him in any of my screens. So, but Diane, I, I thought your presentations today were quite spectacular. The, the cut you made of the normal heart and showing the relationship of the anteroinferior buttress, the septum of the atrioventricular canal relative to the infraroceptal recess is emphasizing the point that, uh, that Adrian has just made. And that was such an exquisite dissection that you've made. I've not seen that one before. Well, it, it was kind of a happy accident uh, because my specimens have not arrived back from Phoenix yet. So I didn't have the heart that I had dissected to show that. Uh, muscular buttress in the inferoceptal recess. So I knew I had that dissection, uh, which I made quite a long time ago, and it actually uh, matched very well with what Justin showed. And also, when you put the, the two cuts, it showed beautifully the point you made, that if you go through the aortic leaflet of the valve, you come right up into the aortic root. I thought that that was such a fantastic di dissection. And I, although you weren't using, as it were, your best hearts, I think you made all the necessary points. So it, uh, it emphasized beautifully the points that I wanted to make. And I, to my mind, it all worked out remarkably well. I... Diane, since you are there, I just need to ask you, because we always look at the unwaging from the ventricular side, but from the atrial side, because there is a common junction. Do you think that the infolding that happens on the intraatrial level is less in an AVSD in a complete AVSD, especially on the anterior and uh, inferior side? Um, I, I, I haven't looked at that specifically, but I think uh, that is a good point. I, I think it is less. Indeed, I, mean, I, I, I think we can take that forward and we say that because the aorta is unwedged, the aortic mound is not going to be really nearly as prominent. The non, the non adjacent sinus will not, uh, as it were, push into the atrioventricular canal when you have a common junction. Yeah, I, I think for the future, I'm going to have to try and find an atrioventricular septal defect to uh, dissect in such a way to show how the um, atrioventricular canal doesn't uh, expand to give us that inferoceptal recess in hearts with AVSD. That because would be, it, absolutely. I think that uh, the, the points that are coming through today, both from Norman and from Adrian, I, I, I started the session by pointing out that this was an introduction to deficient atrioventricular septation. So if we are all up for it, hopefully we can continue our discussions and move into the more detailed aspects of atrioventricular septal defect because there is still so much we need to discuss. Yeah, yeah. I know mean, we've had, we still have participants with us. Everybody has been very quiet. I see we have one question and answer, if I can bring it up, which is from Jason Tan. If the bridging leaflets adhere to the ventricular septum with exclusive vent atrial shunting, will there be left ventricular outflow to atrial shunt as well? D um, I'm not sure. Norman, do you understand that question? I think I do, Bob. Um, I, he's asking about the position, the, the relative uh, um, jet uh, from LV to RA, which uh, I think is. Uh, really more dependent upon the commissure between the superior and inferior bridging leaflets. Indeed. So yes, the, that's, that's what determines be, the LVRA shunt. But that would be the so-called shunting across the so-called cleft, would it not? Between Correct, the of exactly. So that yeah. would be because the left AV valve is incompetent. So Correct. the shunting would be coming from the ventricle, but not at ventricular level. 
rather like, still through into the atrium through the atrial shunt. Yes. I think it's, it's a good point, Jason, because it doesn't mean having an osteum primum type of defect means that there is no ventricular shunting that can be produced by placating the bridging leaflet without necessarily having a tongue of tissue between the superior and inferior bridging leaflet. And if that happens, then a shunting can, can occur easily. Can I make a, an additional point on this LVRA shunt, which I think is uh, very important? Because when um, a jet exists uh, from a, a, a valve leaflet, and there is flow from the left atrium into the right atrium, the jet is actually bent into the right atrium so that um, it may be that uh, this is um, really uh, not a true LVRA shunt, but that the jet uh, is uh, entrained by the mass of flow that's coming from the blood within the left atrium and crossing the interatrial communication. So what you're, saying, that's why, what you're saying is essentially it's regurgitation across the left AV valve and then turning right across. Because across of the, the shunt tissue. flow at atrial level. Yes, yes. Okay. And so right. that, that perhaps, I mean, yeah. you, you know, in the old days, so maybe Adrian, you can remember this, uh, people used to band uh, the pulmonary artery. <laughs> And, and uh, if it was a true LV to RA shunt, there, there would be no um, um, effect of the band on uh, mitigating the shunt. Whereas I think that uh, it was uh, a, a fairly successful temporizing procedure. And the reason probably was because of the atrial shunting, which occurred that uh, uh, moved the shunt from the the left ventricle to the right atrium. There's no other explanation as to why it was successful. Indeed. Well, I don't think we have any more questions and answers. So thank Diane, spectacular presentation. Adrian, thank you for joining us. I hope thank your you. computer is going to be put back into function by next year. Norman, it's <coughs> a pleasure to have you with us throughout the sessions over the, all the time we've been doing this. So Grace has told me that she wishes us to continue into 2023. I'm going to think about the topics we might be wanting to discuss. If anybody wants to, who is still listening to us, if anybody wants to send their suggestions to Grace, we will contemplate your propositions as well. But for now, let me wish everybody the very best for the forthcoming festive season. And we hope to see you all again in 2023, leading up to the World Congress in Washington. So thank you all for your thank presence. You for and all you very best for the festive Happy holidays. Season, the coming year. Thank you all. The best Have a good New Year. Thanks to all of you, Bob. I hope you'll do double outlet right ventricle and revisit that which seems to be a, a really uh, problematic for many, many people in the world. I've got that on board, Norman. Okay, good. Excellent. All the Merry best. Christmas Happy to you, year. Bob. Adrian, you have a year. And to you, Adrian, and to you, Diane. Yeah, happy what holidays. Happy New Year. Happy holidays, Bye. indeed. So let's finish for 2022. Thank you all.